Hello. Hey folks, it's Courtney and I'm back with my fifth video. I want to talk about how I prep autopsies because it's a little bit different from a standard prep, which a prep, by the way, is what we in the industry refer to just any kind of embalming. We just say it's a prep. So it's just interchangeable. So where you get autopsy bodies is most commonly a medical examiner's office and or a coroner office. I have on the occasion picked up a decedent from a private autopsy institution. Sometimes families just want a second opinion. Nothing wrong with that. And if you want to pay for a private autopsy for your loved one, I'm sure you could Google up some stuff and find one near you in your area. So it's very run of the mill how you would pick up from the medical examiner office. You will be trained by whoever you work for. In Texas, we had uh, all manners of coroner offices. There were some where you kind of pull into the like this back area of a parking lot. You go through one door, you go out the other, and it's just kind of a, a revolving open and closed garage door. It's almost like a little drive through, but you know, in the most respectful way possible. But it makes it very efficient. It's very easy. Even if you have like kind of a long line, you have people go in, they go out, and then the next one goes. I appreciate it when places are like that. So if you are left hanging though by your employer and they're just like, go pick it up and call them, then you definitely can call the corner office. There's normally someone there 24 hours a day. They have to accept bodies because of coroner contracts and, you know, people die whenever. So normally there are overnight staff. You can always call them and say, hey, I'm new with this company and I would like to know what the protocol is. I'm going to be picking up a decedent from you today or soon, right now. However, there's normally certain time frames that a medical examiner will release decedents to funeral homes around the Denver area. There's a couple that they only release within a certain window, like a few hours of a day. So, you know, you have to go there there within those few hours and hope that there's not a ton of people. So basically, once you have the decedent back at your facility, you're going to want to get them on the table and you're going to want to get them out of the bag that they're in. Most medical examiner offices will put the decedent in a body bag if they don't already have one. Uh, it's just standard practice, but occasionally if the person is brought in in just a sheet, then they will be released in just a sheet. It all just depends uh, if they get an internal exam or an external exam because external exams obviously they're not going to make the y incision or the cranial incision on someone that they just do an external exam normally that's saved for people that don't have a doctor or they are new to their doctor and the doctor's not willing to sign if that is the case like it has happened here and there they just go down they're like yeah i mean this makes sense given the history from their other doctors and there so on and so forth the standard method for getting a bag out from underneath a decedent is like the same way you would put them in one. What you would do is just unzip the bag mostly. If there is blood within, you might want to leave it slightly zipped on each side. I kind of do to make a sort of pouch for the blood to sit in. So at least if it's going to get on the floor, at least a lot doesn't get on the floor. I always get like their feet out and I tuck it under their head and their legs. And then after that, I would kind of push them up on their side and tuck the rest of the bag all the way under in the middle section of the decedent. From there, I'll go to the other side. I'll make sure that other foot is outside of the bag as well. I will then push up their other hip and I will kind of roll the other side of the bag out from underneath them that I just tucked in on the opposite side. Pretty much all mortuaries that I've been to, there is a certain biohazard bin. We put the body bags inside of that. A company will come pick up those biohazard bins and they will dispose of it legal way. Other than that though, like just stuff that like runs off the table and into the sinks, it kind of just goes down into the city's water system and it's treated just as any other like inert sludge to a degree. Very odd. Basically, the first thing I do whenever I get the decedent out of the bag, I will rinse them off with the hose that the funeral home, um, shit, hold on, scratch my damn head. We'll usually rinse them off with the hose that the funeral home has. And what I really like about prep rooms up here in Colorado is every single prep room I've been to, they have hot water that comes out of the hose. And I love that. Everybody gets washed in hot water. I think your last bath should be warm. <laughs> Just, you know, think that's appropriate. So the first thing that I do is is I rinse them down. I take out the sutures that were left behind by the medical examiner. The medical examiners, uh, after they do their internal exam, well, maybe I should start like at the beginning of like kind of what they do. When someone gets dropped off at the medical examiner 
office, I do have a video. I can try to link it somewhere and I talk about what it's like to pick up a decedent that needs an autopsy and kind of what that entails and fun things if you want to go watch it. I assume once the actual autopsy begins, I have witnessed autopsies like whenever I worked a medical examiner contract, I would drop off people and I would see the physicians conducting autopsies if it was during the day when I made the drop off. Basically what they would do and what I've been told by them is they start with the Y incision. They will go from shoulder to sternum on each side, which is the top part of the Y, and then they will go down to the groin. From there, they will kind of reflect back the adipose and muscle to show the sternum. From there, they normally, I was told, they just use a really sharp scalpel, like just get a new blade on your handle, and you can just kind of pop through that, connect the sternum and the rib cage and all that, and you can kind of just pull that sternum off. And then there are places that will use large medical type <laughs> hedge clippers. I don't know how else to put it, but they are like medical instruments. They're medical grade, an odd instrument to see, but most of the people I have encountered say it's a lot easier. That exposes the thoracic cavity as well as the rest of the abdominal stuff. Move back the greater omentum, I think is the name of that flap that covers everything. It's kind of like a protection thing for humans. I do believe it's the greater omentum. I don't have my, I'm using my phone to film this right now, so I can't look it up, but I would if I could. From there, they kind of weigh all of the viscera, and after that, they will send it to a pathologist, which are, you know, more doctors that will normally dissect it to a degree because they want to see if there's any abnormalities or if the person had, you know, cirrhosis of the liver or if there was maybe a tumor growing somewhere within an organ. There's a whole manner of things that they would want to see. Sometimes they will take a sample, they will put it on a slide, they will look at it under a microscope to see more nuanced things. Things. From there, I assume someone is either already working on the cranium or they have someone that does that before they go and weigh all the rest of the viscera. Because technically, it's an organ. It's part of the viscera. I find it in the bag, so <laughs> that sounds bad. I find it in the bag. From the cranial incision, it is done from top of one ear and it is done to the other ear. Sometimes it's like a little bit behind. Just depends on the medical examiner and if they take into account the embalming afterwards. Some do, some don't. It's it's totally fine. I'm quite the embalming magician, so I don't mind what it looks like. I'm gonna make sure it doesn't leak and I'm gonna make sure it's really hard to see it. Because I've just been doing this a long time, I do really even bites out of the scalp whenever I'm doing my incision to close it and I'll talk about that here in a minute. If you really are curious about how they take out brains, I have witnessed it once at a place where I worked up here in Colorado. We had a gentleman come by. He was a doctor and he was an Alzheimer's renowned surgeon and so he was taking out a decedent's brain so that they could be studied for Alzheimer's, like the presence. They look at it under a microscope. I was sitting in there and I asked him if I could observe and he said, oh, of course. He was very kind about it and he let me watch and my coworker and I just sat in there and we asked tons of questions and he said that they normally can't really tell, but once you look on a microscope, you can see the degradation. And so basically when people have Alzheimer's, he told me it's your brain kind of just atrophies and then those synapses is where your thoughts are going. They just fall into those holes and so that's why you kind of can't remember. Weird side tangent for my autopsy video. Once that is all done and they have examined everything, they will release them to the funeral home. They will call the families to choose a funeral home and then that's where I come in. To get back on track with the actual autopsy prep, they do some quick sutures to keep the Y incision closed. They'll put the viscera all in a biohazard bag. They will place it back inside the decedent. They will put the sternum on top. They will do some little sutures sutures just to keep it all in place. Most doctors will do a little suture and up on top. After that, I have them on my table. I'm rinsing them off with the warm water. I'm making sure if they have any bullet holes or any like lacerations or any trauma to their back, I'm making sure I'm looking at it. I'm making sure I'm rinsing it off. I'm cavity packing it if I need to. I'm putting drying two on it. I am suturing it closed because it's a lot harder to suture that and do all that stuff whenever the person's already embalmed and their features are set and you're trying to like push them over and it's just, I try to do that first so that way they can kind of just like lay there and have those cavity packs working on those wounds and then that way it's already cauterizing while I'm embalming and I found it is pretty good when you do it that way. It's kind of how I was taught and I respect it. After I have assessed all of the trauma on the back, if there is any, I will then start to take out those medical examiner sutures. Little snippy snip, take them, you throw them in the bio hazard bin because they're kind of covered.
covered in blood. The next part would be take the calvarum off of the decedent. Once they do that cranial incision and reflect back the tissues of the face, they kind of have to, you know, they kind of have to peel it down and then they also reflect back the back part of the scalp. They will take off the calvarum and what that is basically the medical examiner will use a bone saw and they will delicately go around the top of the cranium like all the way. Big circle. We call that the calvarum. Some medical examiners are like A1 and they will make a little notch that makes it easier for death industry workers to be able to place it back on whenever we are closing the whole body up at the end, but I'll talk about that as well here in a minute. So what I do is I take off that calvarum, I rinse it in the sink or with the hose water. I will then spray it with dryene too, because like I said, love it. Also, I have used X-Tone. That's what I was trained with. I also hate the smell of X-Tone. It smells freaking horrible. I also like this stuff called Chlorosan is also great. It smells kind of minty. It doesn't have such a like medicine type of smell, which I think that's like the best way to describe X-Tone is it's almost like smelling cough medicine or something. It's really weird. The second thing that I do after I put that to the side, I normally try to keep it near where I put the sternum and I will talk about that also in a moment. Once I have moved the calvarum out of the way, that's whenever I address everything that's in the torso. What I do at this point, I will take the sternum that the medical examiner go along the sides of the rib cage to have access to the thoracic cavity. That means that I can just kind of lift out your sternum. I put it in a bin of hardening compound and Instead of doing that, I also sometimes will just have a towel laid out on the under part of the table. I will put the sternum on there and I'll cover it with the powder there and just let it kind of hang out with me in the room. I mean, it is part of the decedent and I think it should be near them. Uh, and also it's kind of gross to be putting them in the bin, like in the hardening compound bin. It just seems a little seems a little weird, but you know, whatever. I'll do whatever you guys tell me to do. Uh, whoever contracts me, if you tell me to put it in the bin, I'll put it in your bin. Also, pro tip again, if you put your sternum in the hardening compound, you run the risk of forgetting it. That is also a very horrifying thing because one, I have done it. It was way back in the day when I first got licensed. I had put the sternum in hardening compound and I did not put the calvarum on top of the bin because whenever I was done suturing the Y incision, I remembered the sternum and I look, <gasps> I was devastated first off. And second, I look in the bin, I see it. I'm oh devastated again. So I go, I pop open the whole Y incision. I put that baby in there. I sutured him back up. My hands hurt for three Three days because of how much I sutured. It was horrible. Don't forget your sternum. Put your calvarum by it or at the very least put it under the table on a towel or a bed pad. That way you don't forget it. I still feel bad about that, sir, madam. I'm very sorry that I did that. Once I have taken care of the sternum and I've put it where I can find it again, I will then take the viscera bag that all of the person's viscera is going to be in, like brain, the heart, the lungs, all of it is going to be in there, the intestines, the liver, all of that viscera. I give it a new bag. I normally will take one of the PVC buckets that we have in most prep rooms up here and I will line it with a new biohazard bag. I will then take the viscera. This is like like kind of hard to do with my mic, but I'm going to try to do minimal hand movements this time. So I'll take the viscera. I will put it outside. I have also had to use like a really big mop bucket basin because this gentleman was of size and I didn't know where else to put it. It wouldn't fit in a normal bucket. And so I said, all right, sir, I'm sorry about this, but I'm going to put your viscera in this receptacle here because I got to, I got to improvise. And it worked out perfectly. And I was like, you know, and I, I will do it again in the future if I have to, whatever it is, I will take the viscera to the side. I will take my scalpel, I'll cut the side open, and I will pour it into the receptacle. This new biohazard bag, I also will fill with a little bit of dryene too. Some people will put a uh, Halt GX in it, which is a Dodge product. It inhibits the growth of bacteria, and it helps with like tissue gas and certain things of that nature. So, I mean, I think you're supposed to inject it, but some people just put it in there, add a little bit. You can do many things. Um, I was taught to just put cavity fluid in there, and so I I will do a bottle of drying too, and I will also put cavity fluid in there. Really just depends on what the uh, establishment
government has access to and what they buy because it just depends on if I'm buying the chemicals or if they are. Because I'm gonna, you know, use my favorite things, of course. But if that's not what I have access to and not in the contract, then that's fine. I'll use whatever's in there. Kind of, I can, I can pretty much embalm anybody in any condition. Uh, whether they're viewable or not, I cannot guarantee, but I can embalm them and they will be a lot better for it. When you're putting everything within the viscera, you kind of want to use a trocar and or your scalp. You can pop the viscera with these giant instruments. It creates holes and it does the cavity fluid work, as I have mentioned in my previous video, if you want to watch it, that you get your best chance at fight against all of those gases and bacteria that's like trying to take over in your decedent. You're kind of doing that, just it's outside of the decedent this time. And I mean, most things in the prep room are kind of made to be mixed together, like chemical wise, whether it's like Pierce or Dodd, pretty much any cavity fluid together. I've heard of like some really high index stuff. I saw on a website, I think it was Pierce, they have 50 index stuff, which I'm like, wow, that must be insane. Which I always compare cavity fluid stinging. It's like onions when it, you're cutting up onions and it stings and you're like crying, you can't get away from it. 50,000 times worse. From there, once I have the viscera chilling and it's treated and I have it safely to the side, we'll start assessing the person's vessels because some medical examiners don't nick the vessels when they're taking out the esophagus and all of those things because those are removed so you kind of don't have a throat anymore when you get autopsied. But uh, I'll give you a throat, I promise you're gonna look fine. Basically, after I mix my fluids, I normally go pretty hot with my injection. I will use a very high index fluid or or I will just use a lot of low index on autopsies because most of the time if they needed an autopsy they died questionably at the very least and so they may have been dead for like a week or a couple days. And by that point you have decomposed a little bit, not as bad as you would have without intervention and a cooler, but some people have slight green tint to their viscera and their muscles on their stomach and abdomen because it kind of starts in your lower right quadrant anyway. So until they can get to you in the schedule of autopsies you might be sitting there for maybe be like a few days or so, it just really depends. Which you may hear morticians refer to someone being posted and they're talking about a post-mortem examination. From there, I will start the actual embalming. I will inject both carotids first because as long as the face and the hands match color-wise, which I'm just pale as a ghost, let's be real. They wouldn't have to try that hard with me and cremate me. What I will do is I will inject the face first. So it makes my eyes water the most. So I'll do that first. Carotids, so like the left and the right. Sometimes the medical exam examiners will nick the vessels a little bit and so if that happens I normally will use like a straw. It's very hard to do but it is possible if the carotid is large enough you can use like a little straw to kind of go in there. They make vessel separators and wideners and things like that. Normally though I'll just pull up on the tissue of the throat and I will try to find where the little tiny cut is from the scalpel. I'll just put the cannula in that part of the vessel and I'll inject there. I have had to hypodermically inject people's faces before. Uh, it's very malleable, so I'll kind of press around the fluid and try to get it everywhere. And if worst comes to worst, you can totally just use Postine Ultra on the face and neck. It's great. It's this hot pink stuff. It's almost like Singel, but it's not as caustic. What I mean by that, if you put that on a visible area of the body, it's going to dry out. It's going to dehydrate. It can almost make like a leathery appearance on them, so I do not put that on somebody's face, just pro tip again. Use some Postine Ultra. It is not as caustic, it has a little bit of dye in it, and the worst it's gonna do is just you have to use a lot more uh, massage cream, Calon cream, whatever you want to call it. You have to just use a little bit more of that. I use like some Vaseline normally on the side of the face that I have to do that. I've hardly ever had to do it though. Most medical examiners, at least up here in the Colorado area and everything, it's they're pretty good. They don't, normally don't make too many little nicks. So from there, you kind of have to reflect back the muscles and get at the axillary arteries on each side of the arms. Very rarely do I have to go further than what's already made with the incisions. There have been times that people have had trauma and I've had to pull their femorals from the part of their thigh that had no trauma to it, inject the leg that way because the common iliacs that I normally use, there's trauma from there to the leg and I had soft fluid filling up in the abdominal cavity and from that point you're like, something's wrong. Start, you know, pulling other arteries. It's 
normally just like heavy trauma cases. I had a person that was in a wreck. They had this giant gash near in her thigh that I didn't see until I started injecting. And then I was like, oh, where's this coming from, bud? It's wild. But yeah, I mean, I'm an embalmer. I see some stuff. And then I'm like, oh, wow, okay. That's new. Easy to take care of. We were taught in school van, vein artery nerve. There's always a cluster of them where your axillary is. And so I you know, reflect the muscles back, make small incisions until I can get to that area. It just embalms the whole arm. Usually looks great. And then from there, your abdominal aorta will travel all the way down your spine. And it is quite big. It's very large. Uh, it was amazing the first time I saw it. From there, you use your common iliacs, which is just the branch off from the abdominal aorta. It turns into your common iliac and then your internal iliac and your external iliac. A lot of stuff going on, all right? You're magic, you're human. After I get everything injected, that's whenever I start to close them up. So, I mean, it's really just another day whenever you have to embalm an autopsy, but I will admit the first time I saw an autopsy prep was at my first job. <sighs> and I was just like, it was incredible to just see the human body from the inside without any organs in it. Cause you just see the inside of the rib cage and you see the spine, which I had no idea how big your lower spine is. It's huge, massive, big. <laughs> what I normally do at this point, use the aspiration hose. They do make autopsy aspirators, which I'll insert a picture. It'll make it easier. Weird thing filter on the end and it's metal and it's like shorter and it's not stabby or pointy like the trocars are. Little aspirator and you suck all of the fluid out that got returned back into the cavity from when you were injecting. Your drainage is just going back into the abdomen, which is fine because it actually coats the abdomen with embalming fluid. I will admit I put a towel over in the Y incision just because I can't deal with all the fumes. Most of the time it gets to me. Whenever I'm closing up a decedent, I prepare the torso. And what I mean by that, we have these one pound cotton rolls and I will roll that up and I give people throats. I will coat the area with hardening compound. I'll roll up the one pound cotton roll. I will make a cylinder that bit smaller than I should. And then I can kind of just add to it after that until it looks like a normal throat. You can tell if the embalmer put a throat or not. Most people I know and have worked with, they will put a throat for the person. It just all depends on how they do it. I think the one pound cotton roll is the best. Once I have it in place, I will then continue putting hardening compound all over the Y incision and all over the inside of the torso. So there's like a fine layer of it. And then also in the pelvic cavity, I will roll up some more one pound cotton roll. I'll put some drying too on it. I'll wrap it again and I'll stuff that in the pelvic cavity just to make sure there is no leakage on that end either. From there, take the bag of viscera. I will use that autopsy aspirate, put a bunch of water in the sink with sanitizer. And then I just use that throughout the embalming and I switch it for each person. If I do more than one at a facility, I'll, I'll just keep giving them new stuff in the sink. From there, I will use that autopsy aspirator and I will get all the cavity fluid and all that drying and stuff out just so there's no excess fluid within them. I will take that bag. I will put it within the Y incisions. I put it back basically. So like the medical examiner put that in there for me and then I gave them a new biohazard bag and I'm putting that back in their Y incision basically like inside of it because I'm going to close them back up here in a minute. Once I put the viscera back within their torso, I will cover it with hardening compound. I normally take my scalpel or one of the autopsy needles and I will poke holes in the bag just because I have a fear of the bag swelling with gas and causing leaks and or purge on the decedent while they're in their casket. I try to keep thinking like 12 steps ahead of myself whenever I'm embalming and I'm like, you know, if they purge, that's going to be bad. Nobody wants to see purge on their loved one. It's, you know, traumatizing. It's horrible. It looks crazy. And it's not like building up pressure within their abdomen. After I have put the viscera back, I will then put the sternum back on top and it's covered in that hardening compound. I put that back on. I do have like a weird process. So I don't actually close the Y incision until after I close the head, just so that way it can hang out and sit and I just lay it closed. It's a lot to suture up the torso. I try to do that last. It's a huge area to suture. I will close the head first. And then also that way I know that like they're looking good whenever I'm finishing them up, then I immediately clean them. How I close the cranium. I go over, I get the calvarium that I covered in drying earlier. It's normally like dry as a bone, because it is. And I will take some stuff called inner seal. I'll put a picture in. It's like this weird Play-Doh type stuff, but it hardens. It dries down. It's injectable. I would use it a lot at uh, the cemetery I worked at because we just had a lot of autopsies there. And so I would normally put it in a really wide, like a big syringe with like a big opening and just not put a tip on the syringe 
syringe and I would just like inject it into the form and magnum. I've injected it into the back of people's throats before. I've injected it into nasal cavities. I will make a little ball with it and use it to replace their eyes. It's also great for incisions as well if you're really worried about them leaking and if you keep it on deck at your funeral home or mortuary then you could insert it within the Y incision and really make sure there is no leaking if they're a ship out or anything of that nature. Once it dries it's almost like cement I guess. It's crazy. I love it. So I will use like my hand. I will scoop some out. A big spatula thing. Place that all the way around the bottom like where the calvarium was taken. Bone incision basically. It's going to just keep your calvarium in place and even then once I put the calvarium on and I kind of mold it. It's almost like a weird play-doh clay. It's like whipped play-doh. I don't know how to describe it. I'll try to put a picture in of what it looks like too if I can find one. I will still use the muscles from the tempora, the temporalis, like there are these bones and then if your temple has these muscles and they normally are left behind, not always, but most times they're left behind and then you want to actually suture back and forth between the two and you want to make sure that your calvarium is in place because you don't want it to slip or move because if it does it could cause deformation to the face of the decedent and it makes their forehead kind of look really strange. A lot of people will like pack the cranium with a one pound cotton roll. They do make cranial inserts. I've seen them on the embalming websites. That's like the beauty of embalming is it's, it's an art form. It, there's more than one way to embalm a body. From there I will take just like some cotton and I will put some drying to on it or like some X-Tone or uh, Chlorosan, whatever is at my disposal. I will then pat the whole area of the scalp, like the inside part, and then I also will put a tiny bit of pierce seal. I won't do too much, but I put like a little bit of pierce seal just so that way there's like a little bit of extra absorbency and then some like bad cases if the person has been down for a long time. Then I will put some of that that Postine Ultra I mentioned earlier, I will like line the inside of the scalp with it and it actually embalms from the inside up at that point because it's a topical embalming cream. So it's it's pretty cool. I love Postine Ultra. Also, if there's any trauma to the face, like if they have a laceration, they were in a car wreck or they have a gunshot wound, you can use Postine Ultra to dry out all of those wounds and cuts and then at the end, wipe that out. They'll get super dry, easier to just glue down the skin and then later on, on whenever it's time for their service, you can wax over that a lot easier. So after I've done that, how I start to close the cranial incision is I always start on the viewing side. That way, if there is any extra slack, if you will, then it will be hidden on the non-viewing side. I start on the right, the person's right. I will do my normal thing where I, like, there's the top of the incision, right? Like the point where they stopped. And I will take my ligature and I'll go through and make a little knot so that it's hidden underneath and like in the tissue and then I just kind of go back and forth and I do my baseball stitch and I go very very small. I do about like three centimeters or so in between each poke of my needle. I try to use a smaller one. I mean there's all kinds of needles. It's just whatever you're comfortable with. I personally like using a smaller autopsy needle. They're kind of like a curved. I'll insert pictures. I use that. I use a small one and I just go back and forth very uniform, very little small bites if you will. That's what I've always heard them referred to as. Uh, little nips of the needle. Once I go back and forth all the way, I make sure to keep it tight the whole time because you really want to avoid a leak in the head because you don't want any embalming fluid and or blood to be seeping out of that incision and into the pillow and it just could cause some odors and or an unpleasant view. And I mean, you want to keep the family's memory picture as like your main point of focus from there. They're all beautiful. I will normally cover their head in either conditioner or fabric softener, whatever the place has. Fabric softener is a lot cheaper and it works a lot better in my opinion, but normally conditioner, if you just coat their hair in conditioner, it's a lot easier to get all the tangles out. Either method works. I like to let that sit while I'm closing the Y incision. So I actually use like those little banana clips that like hairdressers use. I use those banana clips to like keep hair out of the way while I'm embalming and while I'm doing the cranial stuff. Uh, Cause we do technically, I forgot 
forgot to mention this, but you have to clamp off the circle of Willis within the cranium when you're injecting the carotids, because if you don't, then it doesn't really stay within, it just shoots out. Uh, so you, ha you have to clamp off the circle of Willis, uh, but I'm not trying to get like too far into that at this point, so my bad. After that, I let the hair hang out and detangle with the conditioner. I go to close the Y incision. So I will add more hardening compound if I need to, and most of it kind of absorbs at that point. It's almost like Orbeez, those weird little balls that like absorb water. It's almost like that, but it's like sawdust and paraformaldehyde, which is like the solid form of formaldehyde. Uh, formaldehyde, like I've said before, it's a gas technically, and it's combined with water. That's how you get embalming fluid. Uh, and then the index is the percentage of formaldehyde, parts over 100 parts of water. Index 25, you have 25 parts of formaldehyde gas combined with 100 parts of water. Bam, there you go. I paid $20,000 to learn closing up the Y incision after I put more hardening compound in there if needed. I will then take the points because like that Y has a point like in the middle of all three incisions. So like up, up and down. I start on the far side, like away from me. What I normally do, I double up on my ligature. So I will pull a ridiculous amount, at least like a yard or so, like three feet of ligature, right? I will then fold it on itself with the needle. I thread the needle on the ligature and I tie a knot at the end and I make that knot really big. Like I tie it like five times so that it'll hold its place in the, in the tissues. <laughs> so after I have my anchor is more so what I refer to it as like when I'm teaching people, I go through on the far side. So I will use those big autopsy needles as well. The sharper the needle, the easier it goes through. Some like dull needles, you really got to push and it makes your hands really sore. That was the one thing that I had to get used to was suturing autopsies. Cause like I was getting like blisters on my hands from the amount I worked at like a place with a really high call volume and we got a lot of autopsies. Gotta suit your mind. I will then go through the middle, so like through the top of the Y, like the center part. I will go through that point. You always want to go under the tissue and then come out the top of it. Uh, side note, when I saw Tupac Shakur's autopsy photo on Rotten.com as a wee last, like 12 years old. It made so much more sense whenever I actually like closed an autopsy incision myself. I was like, oh, done the little, they just barely sutured it up. That's why it was like open. I, I'm sorry. I was really off topic. I will go from the far side. I will go to the center. I will go to the right. So like the part closest to me, I will pull very tight on that ligature and it's doubled up. You want to make sure it's not gonna like slip either. So you want it to be waxed ligature. That's kind of why they sell all kinds because you know, you might use use it on clothes or like the decedent's clothes or some you might use just on normal like uh, embalming incisions and then some you want to use like waxed ligature on the actual wine. Once you've pulled them all together, you're going to just start going back and forth. I normally just do a baseball stitch because I'm already doubled up on my ligature anyway, all the way down to the groin. The way that I tie it off is kind of weird. I try to do it so that it's like hidden underneath and I'll do a tiny knot at the end to, so that way it's, it's just like chilling and it can't loosen itself. It's very hard to explain. I have no idea how else to put it for you guys. After I'm done with the bottom, I will do both the sides. And from there, I will then rinse off the decedent with water and I will wash their hair. I'll wash them off with the dish soap or the prep soap or like, you know, whatever the place has. I will also address any other trauma. So like if the person has a bunch of lacerations and things, I let them drain during the embalming. And then afterward, I cavity pack and then I suture it up. So I save that for like the very end and then I will clean them after, you know, the, ba the bath time starts. This is my favorite part. Once they're dried off, normally I will glue the Y incision, not the cranial. That don't, never, never glue the cranial, the people's hair. No. Glue over the Y incision with this stuff. They have like True Seal, uh, Perma Seal is one. They have like an aerosol can, which is sick. And then I will use some Webrill and I'll kind of pull in strips and I'll cover the Y with it. So that, it's just an extra little layer of protection. And then that way they don't dehydrate either. I don't know if it's just a Colorado thing. Dry climate thing, but like the, the Y incision, if you don't glue it, they will kind of dehydrate through the incision and it's Kind of, it's really strange looking, honestly. After that, I mean, they're basically done and you can uh, put them in like a union all, which is just a big plastic onesie, which I can try to insert a picture. I don't know if I'll actually find one. You just want to like monitor them, watch them, make sure they don't leak, make sure that their cranial incision isn't leaking. I have had to open a cranial incision. It wasn't my prep, but it was my buddy's prep. He asked me, he's like, hey, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know if I just can't do it tight enough. Pop this person's scalp open and redo it for me. And I was like, yeah, of course. And the person would have been bombed like a week prior. You have time? 
with them, then you have time to fix whatever problems arise. And so that is also the benefit of having them in-house, like having your decedents stay with you. The longer that they sit with you though, like the more problems can arise, like post-mortem blistering and things of that nature. With that though, I shall conclude and wrap this up. I'm not too sure what my next video will be. I hope you guys have had a wonderful holiday season. I hope you enjoyed your Christmas and spent time with your loved ones. I know I had a great time because well, I've got a ham in the kitchen that I need to put in the fridge. Oh my god, we gotta put the ham in the fridge! So Sorry, I had to tell Mike. But all right, guys, so I'll wrap it up there for you. I'm Courtney. I'm a little creepy, and I'm still here hanging out.